Uh, but for now, let's just focus on the uh, the kernel. So I don't have a, any prepared material here at all. Uh, I wanted this to just be uh, an actual uh, both where we discuss things, uh, you know, people who are working on trying to get the kernel working with LLVM or get the kernel working more, because I know it's already working for some people. Uh, maybe we could maybe go around and all uh, talk about what we're doing, uh, say hello to each other, and uh, maybe coordinate a bit about what we're um, up to. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Mark Brown. I'm the kernel working group tech lead at Lenara. And um, we've uh, recently started uh, picking up uh, some of this work. Uh, Lenaro's go uh, working on getting some automated build testing uh, running with kernel CI. And then uh, once that's there, uh, we are, our essential plan is to sit down, look at the errors and warnings we're getting, and um, submit patches for those that nobody else has done. Um, uh, our, our initial focus is going to be on ARM64 and x86. Uh, ARM64, because that's what, um, as Lenaro, we care about a lot. Uh, and x86, because realistically, uh, the kernel community is mostly x86 based, so we need to do that if we want to get anywhere. How bad is it today? <laughs> Sorry. How bad is it? Uh, is it talking to it? How bad is it today? It, so on x86, um, it will point uh, the kernel will point blank refuse to build because um, of Asm go to, uh, which um, I understand that there's some patches floating about which might be published soon uh, to fix. Um, but yeah, on, on x86, it's just a non-starter because of that. Uh, on ARM64, you can build and run a useful kernel already. Uh, and there are production systems shipping with uh, Clang built kernels. Um, you can't do everything, but it's um, tractable. <laughs> but just to throw a spanner in the works, mainline dev config doesn't build with a released Clang 7.0.0 binary from LVM.org. Uh, there are a couple of missing features there. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the SSE atomics are um, uh, a big one there. Uh, in good news, is this on? In good news, PAPC works, um, so you can build uh, PAPC 64 little endian and big uh, some things internal compiler around big endian. Um, you can build 64-bit embedded, and I've boot tested it, and I am reliably informed that 32-bit PAP PC works as well. So for things that aren't ARM and aren't x86, there is PAP PC, and it builds and boots. Yay. <laughs> In other good news, 686 also works if you revert a few patches, like the ASM go to. So we, we use it now. It works. We use it Who, for... Who's we? The dynamic tools team at Google, we use it with the memory sanitizer, which is not upstream, but we build the and, and run and use the x86 kernel, build with Clang. So you're working on uh, Clang. Are you uh, pushing any of your stuff upstream or for Clang, not, or are you just using it? Not much. So we report some issues to Cynic and other people. Yeah, but. We, we don't we don't yeah, okay. do much fixing ourselves. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Nick uh, at Google. Um, I used to work on a kernel team for the Pixel phones. Uh, I now work on the LLVM side of the equation. Uh, so I've been uh, working on this for a little bit of a uh, little while and uh, trying to coordinate. Um, both getting reports to LLVM developers' hands and then now trying to fix things on the LLVM side and get people on the LLVM side to pick up, pick up uh, feature requests or bugs and, and implement them as well. Um, so I'm super interested in hearing people's experiences or, or getting in touch with people, trying to sort out what issues that people are facing, um, maybe getting help prioritizing these things, 
um, and just seeing you know what what people's results are with testing this stuff. So. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, hello, my name is Bean Webster. Um, I guess uh, to a certain extent, um, I was around for near the beginning of this this work. To, to it's move all your kernel. fault. It's partially my fault, and uh, certainly some of you have blamed me for it. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, I don't work on it as much uh, anymore, uh, certainly. Uh, and uh, but very very glad to see that uh, so much work is being done. Uh, certainly with uh, many of you that I spoke to uh, years and years ago about this in the first place, so. Who's next? Okay. Heads? So last, last time I tried to enable this in kernel CI with an upstream kernel and upstream, like a <clears throat> shipping LLVM on x86 and ARM, things wouldn't Things just didn't work with the de the main the main uh, the shipping def configs and the shipping trees and stuff. So how how far are we and where are the obstacles from actually doing with upstream LLVM or shipping LLVM and a shipping kernel and def configs? Um, the, um, there's a couple of LLVM features that are uh, are needed. So um, there's the Asm Goto thing which you mentioned uh, SSE Atomics. Uh, I think it is on arms. Yeah, uh, LSE Atomics. LSE, sorry, yes. Yeah, the LSE Atomic thing is um, special ABI reserving special registers. Yeah. And there's also um, KVM does not work with, uh, with, with Clang because Clang will generate a jump table using absolute addressing. We need a hack to avoid yeah. that. Yeah. Happy so see it's mostly just config options. So there are a few things like we don't, Clang doesn't support the vector instructions required to build the RAID stuff unless you twiddle some options. Yeah. Um, but it's mostly there. I'm speaking to the microphone. Oh, it's mostly there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, that's just kind of the same situation on ARM64. Um, you can turn off sufficient things to get it working. Um, but that, that, you know, they are in the def config. There are a couple of patches making their way into mainline, but again, they're mostly there. Yeah. All right. So is there, a, is, there a, is there a known blessed place to grab the LLVM that has the right, the right features to actually build and boot mainline? Um, so I think one of the things that, that we're looking into right now is some, some automated testing. Um, and I think the thing that is a little tricky is um, like as, as we need to ship features in LLVM, like how fast can we get those into people's hands? Because yeah. LLVM has its own release schedule, um, which is like every six months, I th believe they put out a, a major yeah. version release kind of thing. So um, for instance, like the LSE Atomic fixes um, like we've r very recently implemented them in Clang, but you know how soon is it until that becomes a published version number is always a question. And then for any given Linux distribution, you know it takes time for a maintainer to, to pick that up and package it and put it in in your favorite distribution that works with your setup kind of thing, right? So um, one of the things that that I started using recently that I've had some success with um, is uh, there's a, a site apt.lovm.org that packages nightly builds of uh, Clang and the LLVM tools. And so if you're on a Debian-based distribution or you can apt install, you can get a nightly build of, of Clang that's pre-built. Otherwise, um, right now, building from source kind of thing. Yeah. For those of us. Uh, I, d I don't know. Uh, the, the question was around what's the easiest way to get um, LLVM that has uh, any given required uh, fixes. Kind of thing. Um, is there any mileage in having something like the kernel.org cross tool for LLVM? Because there are lots of people not using Debian who don't want or who don't want to add arbitrary random sites to their app list, don't want to have the compiler arbitrarily update. Sure. So, so like, I, I, I think the hard part is like finding a way to package it in a way that works for everyone because everyone does Linux differently, 
So like last week we had a request where someone says, like we sent a patch for fixing a warn up and so, someone said, well, where's the Docker image? You guys should just give us a Docker image. So, I, and mean, then the, I mean, the standard way that various places do this, the Lenaro toolchain releases, the kernel toolchain releases are just folders that you can put anywhere. Yeah, uh, that would be a really standard way for people to get hold okay. of. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's like something we're not aware of kind of thing. So uh, I guess, what did you call it? Was the kernel.org? So there is actually two more places where you can get reasonably pre-built uh, versions. Uh, one is the Linaro CI system where we automatically build uh, new snapshots every night. You can find those on snapshots.linaro.org. I don't know the exact directory off the top of my head, but you can find it looking around there. And the other place is in the Android sources. Uh, Android comes with its own version of Clang that has a couple of patches, and you can use that version as well. And it generally has the patches needed to build the kernel as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think from from my perspective at the minute, we're kind of um, until with the state things are at the minute, um, it's probably reasonable to tell people that they can build from source. Um, because the, I mean, Clang is actually is, is not complicated to build. I mean, it's a bit slow, uh, but it's not complicated. Uh, and then you can get something that's just in the directory that you can uh, you can refer to. Um, but I think at the minute there's you're talking about a Git snapshot or whatever revision control system they use. I think it is Git snapshot. So it's kind of uh, they use SVN and like supposed to last week move to entirely to Git. I don't think they've completed that move on time. Yeah. So. The Git mirror worked out. Okay. Oh, that, yeah, that, that was what I was using, I think, was the Git mirror. But yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think one of the things that's, that is, like, things kind of depend at the moment on your configurations. Uh, so if you have an off-the-shelf config, if it's a def config, um, def configs change over time, right? So LSC Atomics was a config that was not default on until, uh, within the past couple of releases, I believe. Yeah. Um, but uh, depending on your kernel configuration, your mileage may vary. So for Pixel 2, we shipped a Clang built kernel compiled with Clang 4. So we were able to use a fairly old version of Clang to compile the configs that we were using in our kernel configuration. In your old, in your old kernel, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'll make a comment on the dev config, any new architecture, any new feature in the architecture will be on by default in, in def config or in kconfig. So I guess we'll have this problem every time we add a new feature to the architecture. Sure, I mean, if, if we're adding things on our architecture, like the tool chain needs to support these things if you want to use them. Yeah. Uh, of, of course, it might also be that Clang becomes the fastest compiler to be developed, and therefore all the GCC people get things broken instead. But. Uh, that's always going to be fun. <laughs> um, so th um, that's where to get the tool chains from. Um, did anybody else have any top uh, issues they ha were having with Clang at the minute or um, anything they wanted to? So, so far we're only talking about the C compiler, right? What's this, is there any effort of the assembler and linker and stuff like, especially the parallel linker is actually quite attractive. Uh. Yeah, so uh, as of maybe three weeks ago, I was able to successfully link an AR64 def config with LLD. Um, uh, we have it boot testing and continuous integration. Yeah. Um, if I think, I assume there's probably more work. I haven't even tried an all yes config um, I haven't tried multiple RAND configs um, kind of thing, but I would say uh, it's my personal priority to focus on compiling, then to look at uh, the rest of the cross tools. And my personal uh, feeling on this is that we're closer to being able to link the kernel with the LLVM uh, linker than we are to assemble it with Clang's integrated assembler. I think there's a long tail of, uh, of work to be done in, in Clang uh, where the where the assembler lives um, before we can assemble the kernel with Clang, but it, it requires more um, more testing. Um, I encourage people like if you're interested in trying it, you can just try it and then report bugs to us. That way we have a list and we know you know are we a hundred 
missing features away? Are we four missing features away? Are we one missing feature away? Like and, how close are we? And, and how complicated are those features as well? Yeah. But, um, for the assembler, I think it's a big difference between inline assembly and assembler files. So for assembler files, I wouldn't even bother do, trying it. For the inline assembly, I think we, are, we should be fairly close to being able to assembly, uh, assemble every single file we have in the kernel for, the, for x86 and ARM64. So for the linker specifically, uh, as far as I know, the only architecture people have actually tr actively tried it on is ARCH64. And frankly, that was because I wanted to get the kernel uh, linking with LLD so I could have our LLD folks use it as a test case. Uh, please don't ship it in production. Uh, I would, you know, I'm hopeful LLD will make a lot of progress and we have experimentally booted it on, on dev boards, but me and Nick having booted it on a dev board on our desk does not mean you should be using it. It means if you're interested in developing LLD, this is a very good time to, like, you should throw the Linux kernel at LLD and see what happens. So the, the other thing that had been on my mind a bit was um, plugins. So the kernel's starting to use GCC plugins for a bunch of things, especially sort of security related uh, and linting related stuff. Um, has anybody thought about working on that? Uh, how to handle that for uh, clients that builds? Case? <laughs> check, um, check. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Um, right now, no one's really working on it yet because. Um, yeah, check. We haven't had uh, we haven't had sort of a here's LLVM and Clang here's your kernel now it builds fine yeah like why even bother yeah it's uh, it's a bit premature that's yeah the 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 time spent by people who actually know Clang and LLVM better focused on actually making it work at all I have a question uh, regarding to performance is there any difference between building the kernel with Clang and building with the traditional GCC? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so do you mean build time to build the kernel no, or time no, to run? No, okay. time to run yeah. uh, so at runtime, there's a number of optimizations that we cannot do with Clang at yeah, the moment. Th th that's the whole asm go to problem. That's, that's where they're refusing that's, that's to. That's one of them. That's others. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, but it's, it's an example. Yes. It's always good to measure your configs. Um, yeah. I would say uh, Asm go to can give you performance wins in specific micro benchmarks that Ingo have pointed out to us. And that has been very helpful for us internally to take these numbers mm -hmm. and say, like, here's concrete evidence that we can get a X percent performance improvement or not if, if this is implemented in the compiler, right? That, that's something that's extremely powerful to present as an argument to, to anyone on, on a tool chain side. Um, the other part of that, which I just checked my email and saw tons of work on this right now, is the kernel makes use of a compiler built-in called built-in constant P that is used for evaluating, like, a, it reminds me a lot of C++'s const expert kind of thing, is my understanding of it. Uh, there are some edge cases where Clang differs from GCC in implementation details, which is legal because it's a compiler built-in, uh, but if you don't optimize these away at compile time, the runtime penalty is noticeable. So we, we had three, four, I've lost track. Of, I think there's between four and five patches uh, to, to match GCC in its entirety, which is not super fun, because this is like bug for bug compatibility with another compiler now. But um, the, main, the main parts have landed, and the last two patches are outstanding. And like, someone's working on them today. Actually, I was gonna give a talk with them. They're supposed to be here and they waited too long to buy a ticket. So he's back at HQ working on, on this right now. 
So part, part of the problem with that particular uh, thing is, is because uh, built-in constant P is being used incorrectly in the kernel. Built-in constant P is intended to be used for pointers, and the problem is it's being used primarily to look at integers in the Linux kernel. So one of the issues we have right now is exactly that. It's a bug-for-bug bug compatibility. The fact is we were misusing a tool the way it was originally intended to be used. Does it work in GCC? Absolutely. But the problem, unfortunately, is, is that people are doing something that happens to work, not that something that's supposed to work. And the, the, a number of the things we've had to fight over the years where people's answers are fix your compiler are indeed because GCC happens to do something that yeah. happens to be convenient for the kernel at this particular point in time, but was not the way it was originally intended. It works magically, not because it was intended that way. Sure. Right? So I'm sure I, I'm, I agree that it's valuable. It's just that it was never intended to be used in that fashion. The fact that it works is, is we're, we're lucky that I, it hasn't been, that something hasn't I, changed to make it I, not work. I, I, I hope one day that we'll have more people who contribute to Linux work on the C standard. Agreed. Because I feel like the kernel community really pushes the, the limits of what the language can do. Paul and, McKenney and does exactly th this for us. In yeah. fact, but, but we a lot of more. Agreed, agreed. But in fact, one of my theories is, is when I first started all this is a lot of people would say, well, the, the Linux kernel uh, has its own version of C because essentially the C standard didn't meet what we needed for the kernel. And what I found over the years when I worked on it is in fact a lot of the, the differences or things that didn't work in fact were now a part of the standard. And the reason they were was because people that were on the standards committee in fact were in fact kernel Said, developers. This is useful, this exactly, should be a thing. Exactly, yeah. so, yep. so built in constant P or something like it, uh, sh should it be in the, in the standard? Absolutely. Uh, at the same time, uh, just by a show of hands, who here has actually uh, read the C standard? Yeah, that's more hands than I expected. What's the matter? But, but the reality is, is, is that most people, even if they have read the standard, of course, don't know it 100%. And so the, the, the reality is, is people will compile something, and if it works, they go, ooh, good, this is great, let's keep going. But as people who port things on a regular basis to new compilers know, uh, things break as things get, you know, undefined behavior is, is, added, uh, is, is fixed and so on and so forth. And this is one of those situations where we're using it in a way that we shouldn't be. Yeah, it, we it, need something that does something similar, absolutely, but th this, yeah. anyway. Like, what, it, I, it, I mean, it's, it's one of the motivations, I mean, there's a bunch of motivations for working on LLVM, and one of the motivations for working on it is to you know, cut, down, uh, you know, cut down on that, and make, or at least make us more deliberate in uh, our decisions with regard to what we're doing right. at the edges of standard behavior. Just talk about plugins really fast, and I know I'm out of the loop compared to some of the other people in the front row, but, um, a number of the plugins that I've seen at least go through that are being used on the GCC side, in fact, were ported from Clang. So, in fact, some of those, those plugins, in fact, are available, whether or not they're plumbed in yet, of course, to, 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 to yeah. you know, the, the point that we should be spending time on other things at the moment. And, uh, uh, yeah, and, and Casey's point that, you know, uh, and, until we can actually build and run the kernel reliably and usefully. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you always have this chain in the egg <laughs> thing. So Casey's like, absolutely right. Al Alexander uh, Popov? who's working on this, like I would love to have this implemented in LLVM. If it was implemented in LLVM, I would get it in pixel kernels as soon as possible, right? right? It's just like we need to get resources, people developing, building features on top kind of thing, um, and having it built in the first place. Um, just a, a, like a fun anecdote for like a recent bug for bug compatibility thing we had to match with GCC was uh, named registers. Uh, oh my God, that so was in, awful. So in C code, you can say, you know, int foo, I would like you to always use this register for it. And uh, the idea is, what happens if you're building for a 32-bit ISA and you exactly. say, I want a 64-bit variable, put it in a register? Exactly. Well, where's the other half of that, yeah. that we, word go? We fixed that partially, but they would only fix it in a very narrow case. And yeah. That, yeah, well, we ended up having to match of how GCC and, and picks thank the goodness. next register. Exactly. Oh, that's not fun. That, that's used for uh, system calls if you have a 64-bit variable. I know. 32 so we, bit ISA. we had to work around bugs in the GCC implementation of that. Sounds or like a fragile thing to bugs depend or on. Just <laughs> GCC bugs that were fixed. Yeah, were they legit bugs, not just changes in behavior that happened to break us? No, that, do, you, do you know which, which version did it change in? Because I want to make sure we are not. I think 4.5 is fine. Based on the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, anything that we can build the kernel with is fine, okay. I think. Yeah, 4 or 5 is too old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've got five minutes left. Anybody else uh, have any? I, I, I would like, I, I like the first question is how bad is it? I would like to flip it, put a positive spin on it, but uh, what benchmarks 
would people like, you know, what, what makes a good tool chain for the Linux kernel? The number one thing I want personally is all of the sanitizers that exist in Clang, that kind of feature, which I'm repeatedly told I'm much better under Clang, but then I can't build a working def config kernel, so I give up at that point. <laughs> Close, I've got one now. Um, what I'd like to see still uh, is um, a Clang build as part of the zero day robot or kernel CI. Because one of the, the biggest problems I certainly had, and I suspect is still uh, an issue, is uh, you unbreak things and then they get broken in the next yeah, merge window. That, that's that's why the Lenaro stuff is the first uh, the first thing we're doing is getting multiple compiler support into kernel CI. Thank you, with Mark. With LLVM <laughs> being well, thank Matt who's actually doing the work. I'm just, Fair enough. <laughs> You're pushing not, for it. That's he's great. He's not here though, so I'll say your thanks. Um, yeah, no, that, that's, uh, we're, we're gonna get that, and that'll also be useful for um, new GCC versions as well. Of course, no, it's um, the same problem. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's, one, once we've got that there, then we're gonna really start drilling down on the um, build and boot stuff, but um, we want, or the, the, the idea is that if we have the kernel CI automation behind it, exactly. that's gonna make our reports a lot more impactful because uh, people know that kernel CI ain't going nowhere. Um, exactly. They know that we'll continue bugging them with the, if, the, if things break. Exactly. So uh, I want to follow up. You mentioned smaller, faster. Uh, I think smaller, faster, right? Better. Better. OK. OK. Let, let's, let's put those in. Like, yes, those, sound, those are like campaign slogans, like smaller, faster, better. Yeah. Uh, how do we quantify that? Like, put those in more concrete terms for me. So smaller binary size. Sure. Is this config optimized for size or config optimized for performance? Uh, I was just being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but I mean, like these are the, the like literally these are questions that we get on the mailing list, right? People want to know: is it smaller, faster, better, right? But well, by what measure? Nick, Nick, the one. At, sure. Um, and what? for performance, right? Like, what performance metrics do people care about, right? We have our set for Android, and we're very careful with them because SOC vendors cheat, like they've been caught cheating on them, right? Um, but you know, people can come up with benchmarks, any given benchmark, people can cherry pick benchmarks and come to us and say, hey, here's a case where you're not, you're not as performant as the competition. And I look forward to that because I want those because then I can turn around and start figuring out like what's going wrong, where, where are we miscompiling, what sequence was it that caused us to, to, to fail this comparison? So for me, it's uh, building the kernel with Clang takes a lot longer than building with GCC. That would be the most important thing for me. Yeah. Um, because me I build too. 1,000 kernels a day. Uh, if, if Clang lets me build 1,500 kernels, yeah. like or, or in like the future. Or my, my version of that is I, I build, build the kernels that I, uh, when I ch check something into Git upstream, I build the kernel to make sure I didn't break the build, build on each commit now. Um, and that limits the number of patches I can apply while I'm at the conference and running off battery. Yeah. Because you're, it's slower, it's less power efficient. The, the irony there, of course, is that Clang used to be faster than GCC, but then GCC's uh, fixed, uh, fixed that and made themselves a lot faster. So they've, they've surpassed the speed of Clang, and Clang oh, added more you. features, which made them slower. <laughs> exactly. So I'm, I'm just saying, it used to be the other way around. That was one yeah. of my arguments for using Clang originally. It was faster. It's yeah. very good. It's very, very good. If we also got the parallel make and the parallel link stuff working, then we might actually that get on bigger machines. LLVM might actually be faster. Yeah, or, or even in, on, in total in total build time. Yeah, even on smaller ones. I mean, yeah. uh, every laptop's multi-core. Yeah. And if you could have the link sta stage on my laptop, it would make a big difference to me. Yeah. Oh, right here. Right, right behind you. Uh, just the point that part's independent. You can use the linker of GCC objects, or so you can all four combinations should work. Um, so we're at the half hour, so it's uh, about the end of time. Is there any final thing anybody wants to bring up? Nope. Uh, for you go. linking, Nick. I, I think, oh, sorry. Uh, for linking, I mentioned that our uh, ARM64 def config is linking on, you know, top of tree build of LLVM, uh, LLD. Uh, I think x86 def config is about, um, I think there were four separate individual issues two flags that I think can be removed from uh, kernel make files because they're redundant or implicit defaults. Um, and 
one that's been picked up by the LD maintainer, and I think one other that I'm losing track of. But that's the rough order of magnitude of how many issues there are with LLD on x86 for. And to be more explicit about the earlier question, if anyone has a benchmark that they think is important, please let Nick or me know so we can run it. And I'm super happy to answer questions or get in touch with people afterwards. Please come find me. Yeah, L yeah likewise. Um, so we're, we're actually over time now. So Barrow, do you want to take over for the uh, user space part of it? No. So obviously I'm not going to kill anyone for continuing to talk about kernel issues. <laughs> So essentially, we can just keep going, this just moving the focus to user land. <laughs> Looks like there's a whole lot of kernel developers here. Okay, looks like people are done leaving and coming in. So essentially, let's continue for uh, what we were talking about in the last session, just moving the focus to user land. Obviously, there's a couple of different user lands that are interesting. Uh, we can get one out of the way immediately, which is Android, which is already building 100% with Clang. So, uh, so no issues there. But of course, if anyone is up for a fun project, uh, you can try getting that to compile with GCC again. I tried and it didn't work out of the box. What were some of the major issues, actually? I'm curious. Like, are mm. there code sequences that, that do compile with Clang that are problematic for GCC? Yes. I didn't spend any real time looking into them, but okay. uh, now I'll, s I'll send you a build log next time I try. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's always good to have two different compilers or even more, uh, more than two compilers to, to uh, test stuff with. And uh, I've never been someone who hated GCC or hated Clang, so I'm all in favor of uh, patches that make both tool chains work. Um, I have a question. How much work do you spend on optimization for, for specific architectures on Clang? For example, I work in GLFC for optimization for Intel platforms, and we work for, X, for ABX stuff, ABX2, ABX112, and it's a lot of effort, so I don't know how much work do you spend on those kind of things, but for Clang and LVM, now in the user space. So, um, is anyone here actually uh, working on the Clang optimizers for most of the time? Apparently not. So that might be a good question to take to the mailing list. Okay, <laughs> okay let's uh, talk about the more interesting user spaces in the Clang context. Where one thing that is still making a lot of problems is trying to get glibc to compile with it. So <laughs> By any chance, is anyone here uh, working on that? I tried once. Oh, good. <laughs> I quit. It was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> no, pretty much the same here, but maybe we can join efforts and make it work again. <laughs> Now, fortunately, with all the other libcs, uh, things are looking better. You can compile a system with uh, muscle, and you see libc uh, with Clang just fine. But obviously, glibc is still interesting. <laughs> muscle is used by an inscription to compile WebAssembly. So that's yeah. they, they report a lot of bugs to muscle. Okay, that's some. Um, 
Uh, there is a there is a branch on Sourceware, official GLibc source code, that is maintained by Google, but uh, they do not approach they didn't approach ups, us upstream yet. So they keep pushing patches. There are recent developments on that branch, but Google just keep for their own and does not seem interested in helping us to narrow down what the issues are to build the claim. So I think it's possible, but uh, we didn't get any uh, information on it, which, is are the, which are the issues that Clang has currently. If you give me their name, I'll put you in. Uh, I can go find out and see why they're not streaming stuff. Because I think that, that's the easiest. OK, I, I, can, I can check the developer name that, that is coming to work on this. In terms of security, for example, recently, uh, in GLibc, we implemented the set control flow enforcement technology support. Is there any plan for building that also for the Clang tool change? Like in terms of, it's against ROP attacks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, for instance, um, Clang has. Uh, so I, I didn't implement this. And I'm just speaking about what. what uh, um, but uh, so. There's two things in LLVM. That one's called CFI, is preventing forward jumps uh, to indirect targets that were not known at compile time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a shadow call stack for protecting. And, and I think they're roughly analogous, but they're, they're, in, they're in Clang, and I think uh, they'll be turned on in Android pretty soon. Yeah, so the next thing that's still causing a lot of trou uh, trouble in uh, building the entire user space with Clang is elf utils. There's a couple of n uh, nested functions in there and a couple of variable length arrays and structs. S uh, anyone working on fixing those? Uh, apparently not either. Is, is elf util part of any utils? Or no, it's a separate th thing that actually duplicates a lot of uh, things in bin utils. Yeah, another package that frequently causes problems when trying to build the entire user space with Clang is glib, which uh, uses asm-goto. So the, uh, that will, should be fixed automatically uh, when the fixes for the kernel side are in. And also, on the glib side of things, uh, there's a tool called GIR scanner uh, that doesn't work with uh, Clang LTO files. But uh, obviously, the workaround for that is to, uh, to just disable LTO for those files. But that's another thing. Sorry, you're saying it scans object files? Or yes. LTO does not work with Clang on those files? Like no, the, uh, that tool scans object files and has no idea how to oh, handle sure. LLVM bytecode. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. yep. I mean, I don't think there's anything we can do on the LLVM side. To right. Like, other than rewrite their implementation to understand our intermediary representation. Exactly. I think, what, what's that tool called? Uh, G-IR-Scanner. It's uh, part of the glib stuff that uh, generates the symbol maps for object introspection. Have you tried the Clang with OpenBlast? The, 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 the Merrick, it's a core library for many of the NumPy, SkyPy, and other stuffs for machine learning stuffs. Usually when we build or rebuild the world, every time the GLibc change or GCC change, that is one of the things that, the core of that thing is in Fortran. So I don't know if you have tried building that library, OpenBlast, in, with, with Clang or LLVM tool change. So anecdotally, if it's part of NumPy and SciPy, then it must somehow build because it builds on Macs, and Apple has not distributed GCC for many years. Like, GCC literally just sim links to Clang. I don't know what kind of hacks they may have in place to make that work, but it does. Okay. Yeah. LLVM has multiple Fortran front ends, though, and that was it. Uh, so there's at least Flang is a front end uh, for lowering Fortran to LLVM IR. Uh, 
Uh, and I think there was discussion at the latest LLVM developers conference in the United States um, about either rewriting it or developing a second one. Um, but I think for high performance com compute, a lot of people are interested in, in Fortran. Yeah, another thing that I know works is compiling the Fortran related parts with GCC and the C related parts with Clang and then just linking them together in the end. Binary compatibility is good enough. If you're really desperate, there's F2C as well, which works. So the good news is that the, uh, this is already the uh, entire list of packages where the, uh, we still have known problems uh, outside of some packages that aren't really uh, the matter of this conference, like a few games. But obviously there's a couple more components in LLVM that we may want to look at, like libc++, a replacement for libstdc++. I think nobody is really using that in the Linux world uh, because of binary compatibility issues that can get really bad for, uh, when, for example, you're linking the system libraries of Boost or Qt or something to libc++ and then you try to run a binary only application that has been linked uh, to libstdc++ on another distribution. Obviously that's going to cause symbol clashes and just, no with almost certainty a crash on startup. But. Chrome OS is still version Yeah, so Chrome OS seems to be using it, uh, which makes sense. Uh, Chrome actually uh, builds against libc++ all the time using its internal copy, unless you explicitly disable it. Is anybody, um, using Clang to build GCC and or vice versa. At some point, we really need to deal with the Thompson attack. So the, we are actually building the Clang with GCC all the time. And the other direction is something that I've actually tried to do, but it didn't work immediately and I didn't have the time to fix it. So the, uh, that's another thing to look into but GCC tends to use a couple of constructs uh, that aren't really friendly to other compilers in its own source. Yeah. <laughs> How is Clang working with AutoFDO? Since AutoFDO is a technology that came up from Google, um, it works fine in GCC. It came up with good performance optimization at some point, but I don't know if it's like super special with superpowers in Clang or LVM. Um, so, so my understanding, AutoFDO is a way of doing lower, someone correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding of AutoFDO is a way of doing lower overhead sampling based profiling as opposed to uh, instrumenting a binary, which potentially can ch change the performance characteristics. Um, so on Intel, this requires hardware support for the auto FDO part, is using the sampling. So on x86, we make use of last branch records, LBRs. Um, ARM, recently, the feature is called ETM, is my understanding. And I believe, my understanding is that there's some kernel work, like that re is required to hook that up, to expose that up through user space. So, yeah, um, the core science stuff, um, including ETM, is that's all upstream. There's um, some. There's only one major framework feature outstanding, but it's all perfectly usable, uh, especially if you're running in full system mode. So you can do. There's people working on uh, using auto FDO with that already. And um, I think uh, we're we're interested in, in using it on on our platforms. Uh, for, for our various devices. Um, I think one of the things that's tricky then is once you have that in place, anything that relies on sampling can be a double-edged sword because if you're not measuring something and you don't have profiles for it, right, you might make the wrong call, optimization call. 
Okay, then the, um, another component of LLVM that uh, currently probably nobody is really using, but it could be interesting, is compiler RT, which essentially replaces libgcc. It's kind of similar to the libc++ situation. Most people just aren't using it because they fear compatibility issues. But in latest versions, compiler RT exports a couple of symbols that aren't in libgcc, and Clang uh, can generate uh, those and actually probably generates more performant code uh, when it's using compiler RT instead of uh, libgcc. So, is anyone working on that? Uh, or maybe f uh, finding solutions for the problem? Um, so some of my teammates on Android LLVM side are working to ship uh, libcompiler RT. The alternative is libgcc, is a lot of like your built-ins and uh, various parts of the runtime um, that aren't part of the, the libc uh, runtime. And I think one of the issues that we're running into has to do with um, symbols being re-exported from libgcc, from libm, that weren't intentionally exported, but happen to be, uh, is my understanding of, of the problem. So tracking some of those down uh, is, the, is the current thing, but we hope to have that soon, at least on, on Android. Okay, then the uh, next thing that is also coming up is LLD. I've actually tried building an entire system using LLD as the system linker, uh, getting rid of B uh, BFD and gold. But that's still somewhat problematic because of compatibility with, uh, between the linker scripts. So <laughs> quite a few tools that you'd find on a usual system use custom linker scripts and aren't compatible with uh, what LLD can handle. Mm. But other than that, it's starting to look good. Uh, it can compile even complex uh, libraries like Qt and then link stuff to it. Is anyone working on the, uh, those problems? Not working, but I know where you can find the patches. Take a look at the um, FreeBSD port stream, like they switched to LOD, so anything that needs a patch or at least has to use the BFD is marked there. What's that you're called? Uh, FreeBSD ports. Okay, looks like we got pretty much everything covered. The, does anyone have any other topics? I've been dealing with this with, for three years. Um, how often do you release Clank? Uh, for example, in GCC, we're used to every April, May, we have to rebuild the world in an operating system. But in Clank, how often is your release? If, if I move, for example, my entire operating system to be built with Clank, in, in what is the season of the year, of the fun of rebuilding and stuff and so on? It seems to be the on roughly a six month release cycle, but uh, I've seen divergences in both directions. So I guess you can assume uh, six months and then adjust it a little. Now also one thing that's uh, frowned upon on the GCC side of things, but that is actually welcomed by Clang people more is just using a snapshot instead of a released version. There's a lot of users of uh, stabilized snapshots that aren't based on an official release version in the Clang world, while the GCC people would tell you not to do that. Okay, looks like we don't have any other topics. Thanks for your attendance. Okay. Well, we're about five minutes after the starting time, but I thought we should probably get started. Um, this is titled as a boff. Um, how many of you have heard of Gen Z? Wow. Well, I, wanted to, I wanted to give a brief overview of what Gen Z was, uh, just to kind of uh, get people to understand what, how we think of it 
um, in our role as uh, Linux developers. Um, and then I want to show um, kind of where we're starting to think about uh, how Gen Z and Linux should work together. Um, there are a lot of things you can do with Gen Z. Uh, we're trying to make sure you can do all of them. Um, I'm here with my, with actually the, the core Gen Z development team at HPE, Betty Dahl and uh, Jim Hull. Um, uh, if you guys have uh, questions, comments, it's supposed to be BOF-like in, informal. Um, and so if you want me to stop presenting and just chat about stuff for a long time, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I thought if we, ha if we had some material that, to kind of uh, set, the, set the stage, people kind of get an idea of what we, what we expect to be, uh, what we're thinking about, um, and how we're kind of getting this, uh, this effort kind of rolling. Uh, so first off, Gen Z is a uh, system interconnect, right? It's a system interconnect like PCI or UPI or, uh, or InfiniBand or Ethernet. It glues parts of the computer together. Um, Gen Z is designed to scale from you know, point to point links between a processor and memory all the way out to a data center. Uh, so it's kind of a big spec. How big is the current spec, Jim? A over a thousand days. OK. The core spec. The core spec. Um, I, I remember at a, at a kernel summit many years ago, um, Linus complained that the UEFI spec was, was so long and he said that he was unwilling to read any spec that was longer than the King James Version of the Bible. Um, so I think Gen Z is approaching that. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that, un unfortunately, it's got kind of everything in it, because uh, it, it wants to do a lot of different stuff and a lot of functionality. Um, and I think it's going to take us a couple years to kind of get an idea of what parts of it are useful in what kinds of environments, because uh, it can do so many different things. Um, it's designed to be switched or point to point. It's supposed to be a memory semantic fabric. That means that you can actually do byte level load store access over this fabric. Uh, so like PCI can, right? PCI is a memory semantic bus. Uh, you can do loads and stores over the PCI bus. Um, InfiniBand is not a memory semantic fabric, right? You can't do loads and stores, addressable loads and stores over InfiniBand, except using some of the verb stuff, which is more of a DMA operation. So InfiniBand is kind of midway between Ethernet and PCI in terms of what its capabilities are. And Gen Z is all the way over in the, yes, we can actually do, we can map a remote machine's memory into my process and do load and store access from my, app, from my application to, to memory located in a remote machine. Um, if you remember about the, the machine program we talked about years ago, a couple years ago, um, the fabric in that was a prototype of some of this stuff. Um, and so a lot of the capabilities we, we were talking about in the machine are enabled by this particular memory semantic fabric. And so when you build uh, systems using Gen Z, you can get a lot of the functionality that we were talking about in a, uh, in a heterogeneous, multi-system image, massively shared memory machine. Uh, we're building systems like this right now under contract uh, to the government. Um, and we are building, uh, we're looking at building some of these things commercially. Uh, so uh, Gen Z is, unlike PCI, uh, Gen Z is packet switched, and that means you take uh, chunks of data, put it in a packet, and throw it into the fabric, and the fabric routes it to its destination, and then a reply packet may, may wander back uh, along the same routing. That means there's routing and addressability and subnetting and all those kinds of questions. There's multipath questions, and there's uh, what, what do you do when you lose packets and that kind of stuff. You're talking about congestion control. and. So you, you, t you, talk about, um, you talk about something like uh, PCI, where it's pretty simple in a lot of ways, because PCI is a simple tree, right? You've got a, you got a hub, and you've got this tree, uh, tree structure, which, which simplifies a lot of the routing questions. Or you look at USB, which is, really is a tree. It's you know, a, a single-hosted single thing, which controls all the routing in the system. Uh, those are very simple. And in Gen Z, we're talking about having uh, and in, and a, 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 a fabric that doesn't really have any particular controller or particular tr root of the tree. Um, and so you can kind of connect things however you like. Um, and then in fact, on top of the physical connections, you can provide a software-defined routing topology, which may not exactly match uh, the physical link. So it's like if you have two routes to a host, the fabric, you may decide for performance reasons or congestion reasons or whatever that you only want to allow the system to use one of those. And you can actually configure that all in software. It's crazy. Um, or, or you can actually set them both up, and then the, the switch will alternate between the two routes. Uh, so you can get some uh, failure, failure uh, recovery like that. You can plug almost anything into it, uh, anything from a processor to a memory board to uh, 
to another computer, uh, to devices, um, GPUs, whatever you want. Uh, it's a ge pretty general purpose device. Uh, uh, so here's the question for this group, of course. Where does it fit into Linux, right? The, the question is, Gen Z is an interesting new fabric. Um, how is it the same, and how is it different from stuff that's already in Linux? So when you're looking at evaluating an architecture for bringing Gen Z into Linux, how do we, look, how do we evaluate that compared to the current software? Because one, one of the simple rules of software is you try not to change too much all at once, um, and, you try not to make, and you try to take existing knowledge from similar technologies and adapt them in similar ways to a new technology so that people understand how it works, we can learn from past mistakes, uh, or we can repeat past mistakes. Both of those are true. The problem with the Gen Z is it's got all sorts of things, but why can't it do that special or better than anybody else? Exactly. And How it says, I can't find it. I, I, the, the key thing that it does is it allows machine room scale load and store access. Nothing else does this. You can literally have an entire machine room of computers on a single Gen Z fabric, and I can execute a load instruction in user space from a process on this machine. Numalink does not scale. Well, does it scale? Yes, this scales to machine room level uh, scales. Can we, can we it, is, it is the only difference between, uh, there's a couple of differences between, because we also sell Numalink, right? Yeah, Numalink is an HPE product. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. So, but, so I understand Numalink quite well now. Um, new, one of the things that Numalink, uh, uh, one of the limitations of Numalink is that it's tied to the particular interconnect of the Numalink uh, technology that we have today. It's a proprietary technology. It's not a consortium standard. That means the only people that sell Numalink are HPE. You can't purchase Numalink devices from anybody. Um, so what? Oh, we actually have a microphone here. Yeah. Yeah. So let me describe how it's different from Numalink. Um, so Numalink is a, uh, Numalink uh, connects the UPI or QPI links on Intel processors together. Uh, that's what it does today. Yeah. Um, which, which means that you have uh, the limitations of QPI or UPI, uh, so you're not directly connected to the process, so you have another level of indirection. Um, that means you have additional latency in the, in the transactions. Uh, Numalink is also currently uh, physically defined by a copper-only media, which means that the, the connection topology is very limited. Uh, Numalink currently scales to two racks. That is it. You can't go beyond two racks for Numalink. It, the wire, you can't make the wires any longer. Yeah. Okay. Right? The signaling doesn't work. Um, and so uh, Gen Z is defined as both a copper standard and, a, and an optical standard. Um, and we have, uh, we have a, a low-cost optical technology that we're working on. And that lets us get further, uh, much greater distance. Um, Numalink is also not switched. Right? It's point to point. It's kind of semi-switched. Whereas Gen, whereas Gen Z is software definably, it's routable. So I can actually scale to multiple levels of switches, uh, obviously with incre increasing latency. But that's what lets me get to bigger scale, right? Numalink is only a memory transport technology. It doesn't define uh, tech, uh, transfers for device information. It doesn't, uh, doesn't give you a, 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 um, a general packet transport, right? So it's a very limited. It's, divine, it's defined as a memory interconnect. Right, so that's what it's for. It's to make big NUMA systems, NUMA link. Right, right. whereas can, Gen Z goes beyond that. You can build a big NUMA system with InfiniBand. There's, there's a company that does that. Right, so InfiniBand doesn't do load store access. InfiniBand has DMA access, but it yes. doesn't do direct process load store. So it works with ScaleMP, for example, does that. What? ScaleMP does that. Yes, but, the, but that only, by, only by using DMA to copy data around yes. instead of doing direct access. Mm. So it's different capabilities. Well, it's especially the same thing. Uh, and InfiniBand is, <laughs> is also not capable of doing devices. You can't put devices on InfiniBand. InfiniBand is a host-to-host -host interconnect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you need this? Yes, please. Absolutely. You're describing an either-or problem here, which is already being experienced for at least a decade with persistent memory. Yep. Uh, and so my suggestion, where does it fit in? Uh, belongs with the uh, originator of the idea to make up their mind on what it is. Yep, um, absolutely. So that's, that's my opinion. Well, so Gen Z is, the, the other interesting thing about Gen Z is it's a fairly large consortium at this point. Uh, I think 60 members, 60-ish large corporation members, probably 
most of the companies that, that you know of in the hardware space are members of the Gen Z consortium. So the hope is that there will be enough of a marketplace there uh, that we'll start to see interoperable products in the Gen Z space uh, that start to, uh, to start to show the capabilities of the system. You know, me, I'm just a software engineer. I'm, I'm you know, paid to do uh, development of Gen Z drivers in Linux, and my employer is happily paying me for to do that. I have no idea where the market is going to take this thing. It's a huge spec. It does a lot of stuff. I think you can understand that it does, uh, it does more than any one existing fabric does today. I have uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see it on your slide yet. Uh, what's the coherency story? Uh, Gen Z doesn't have any intrinsic coherency. Um, it is possible to layer coherency protocols on top of it. Oh. So it's both too much and too little. Yes. OK. <laughs> yeah. In, in the, People are working on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I imagine so, yes. Right. But in, in a heterogeneous environment with multiple system images, you can understand why you wouldn't want coherence. But if you're trying to build a large homogeneous single system image, you can understand why you might want coherence. Well, I guess if I were going at this for the third time, having CAPI and then open CAPI, uh, it's an interesting opportunity to explore how you solve this issue of having optional coherency yep. and how you address the issue of maximizing uh, the coherency story. Uh, the difference between CAPI and Open CAPI is that you can't take advantage of proprietary things. Um, so leaving it out in order to get Open CAPI, yes, that's a compromise. Yep. So yeah, why are you going to build a brand new thing and include it with compromises? So I, I like standards. Standards are awesome. Yep. Um, and Let's have just one more. That would be awesome. Yeah, well, or, or zero more would be even better, right? If we, well, I mean, if we had some existing system that could do what we needed. Well, PCIe 4 isn't here yet. And uh, when it is, it would be great <coughs> if it had a competitor. I believe in duopolies. Uh, PCIe 4 is not supposed to do system to system interconnect. Well, I didn't say they're equal. Right. <laughs> I actually know the author, of the, the, the editor of the PCI4 spec, and I spent the last weekend with him chatting about it. And we talked about the differences between PCI4 and its capabilities and what Gen Z does. And it was interesting, really interesting to talk about where PCI is going. Uh, PCI is really trying to get, trying to, uh, trying to get some more uh, scalability into its specification by adding repeaters into the, you know, a, a better definition of how the repeaters work in PCIe uh, to try to get longer bus lines. Um, and that's a serious challenge for PCI because they're basically having to reconstruct uh, the packets at every, every few millimeters, it seems like, within the machine uh, just to get PCI signaling to work. And that's like, ah, oh, that's horribly tedious. Exactly, exactly. Well, and the reason, the reason where, with the, the, the places where Gen Z is, is maybe interesting is because it is both a packet transport and a memory semantic fabric, you can, you can create a, um, you, can, you can take a single, uh, a single, like an entire machine when connected with Gen Z, and you can partition it up into, uh, into, uh, into separate system images with a collection of devices and a collection of uh, media and a collection of processors um, and, and define a machine in software. Right? Because you have this notion of something which can operate either like InfiniBand with doing DMA transactions or like PCI with doing load and store access. Yeah. There isn't any hardware yet. Uh, the, it, the reality is that it, it, right today is the FIs that Gen Z is using and specified for are the same FIs that we use for InfiniBand, right? So it's, it's going to be the same speed as InfiniBand. But because you're allowed to do different kinds of transactions over it, the kinds of, the kinds of software you can write are different, right? Uh, you can talk about defining enormous, enormous in-memory databases and, and, and avoiding, avoiding, uh, avoiding the, the verbs uh, construction of packets back and forth across the network to transfer data uh, at a packet level. And you can start just doing load and store access, which is lower latency typically, because you don't have to get into the kernel and transfer packets around. You're just doing, you're emitting a, a processor instruction which ends up on the fabric. So it is, it, it's an interesting idea. And so I'm not, I'm not here to sell Gen Z, right? I want to explain what it is and talk about what we're doing to get it into the kernel. Uh, because for it to be successful in the kernel, you, I, I'm, we're going to need to have 
kind of a consensus that yes, Gen Z devices may exist. Uh, we want them to work in the kernel this way. Okay? So I'm not, I, I, I think in arguments about whether it should exist, that's, you know, that's a marketing problem. That's not my technical problem. Um, it has some interesting technical challenges, right? It's a you know, crazy new fabric. Um, and so just like, just like we worked on Itanium for 10 years, it had some interesting ideas. Um, it, it ended up not being as successful as we might have hoped. Um, you know, maybe this, what? Anti -boy exactly, exactly. And, and we, are, we are building hardware with Gen Z in it today for sale for a real customer. So, yeah. Right, so that's the question. How much of the existing infrastructure can we, can we take advantage of? It's not PCIe, right? So we can't use, we can't make it look like PCIe if we want to offer all of its capabilities. Now, one of the things that the Gen Z consortium has been talking about is this notion of PCI emulation, right? If you want to bring Gen Z into a system and not change the operating system at all and just make an existing operating system be able to use it as a device and media bus, you could just make it work like PCIe, right? It's got the same kinds of notions. And so imagine writing an enormous <laughs> firmware blob that sits in your uh, ACPI and uh, UEFI code that makes Gen Z look just like PCIe, right? Imagine doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Could I reuse some of that infrastructure? I hope so, absolutely. And so that's what I want to talk about, how it looks like uh, PCI and USB in particular. USB is obviously not the same kind of performance notion, but it has a lot of the same kinds of to topological notions. And so it's interesting to compare Gen Z and USB for the topological similarity, uh, and, uh, which, is, which, is turned, which has been useful in our discussions internally about how are we going to hook this thing up, right? Uh, not in terms of about how you're going to use it, but how are you going to manage it? So you talk about management. And, and, uh, and actual use of the fabric as separate notions. So you talk about a Gen Z bridge device. Well, the Gen Z bridge device takes, a, 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 takes an, an endpoint and connects, it and, and connects it into the fabric. You know, it's like a PCIe root complex or uh, a USB host controller interface. That's what, a, that's what a Gen Z bridge device is. So when you talk about a Gen Z switch, well, in PCIe, those are also called switches. And USB, that's called a hub, right? You have one. Uh, a way of taking multiple devices and, and communicating with them over a single link. When we talk about Gen Z components, well, the Gen Z component is the fundamental hardware thing that can connect to the fabric. So PCIe, that's called an endpoint, and in USB, that's called a host or a device, right? So uh, when, we talk about, um, when we talk about the fundamental elements of Gen Z are components and links and um, there was one more thing. I forget. Uh, and the components get linked together, right? And, uh, and a switch is just a component that has multiple, multiple links coming out of it and can route packets between them. So a switch is just another Gen Z device, a Gen Z component, and it's managed just like all the other Gen Z components, and you can configure it to route packets however you like. So unlike P USB, where the hub is kind of special, uh, and Gen Z switches are pretty, pretty generic. It depends, right? It depends on how slow your switch is. We're, we're, you know, we're talking, we're talking on the order of, you know, tens of nanoseconds for switching latency. But yeah, I, I don't know what the actual values are going to be until somebody builds something. It is designed to be switched, unlike Ethernet, or unlike uh, IP, which is designed for in some bizarro way. In, in particular, the addressing comes pretty early in the packet, so you can route without having to store a lot of data. Um, we have, Gen Z has a notion of subnets. It's kind of a soft notion. Uh, you, don't, you could instantiate an entire Gen Z fabric as a single subnet um, and try to figure out how to get routing to work within that. Or you can actually create subnets and that allows you to do, uh, do some kind of routing construction. You talk about USB as having, um, USB as having uh, hubs and you have all these uh, ad addresses being you know, this hub to this hub to this hub to this device. Well, in Gen Z, you don't have to have that explicit a routing uh, from the source. Uh, each switch is configured uh, to say, when I get a packet with this uh, subnet ID, it goes out this port. 
or if it's on the same subnet as me, then if it's this component ID, it goes out this port. And so each switch is configured in this very straightforward fashion with a flat table of subnets and a flat table of, of component IDs. It's a pretty simple uh, notion of routing, but it does allow some flexibility. And it allows, again, uh, the host. So the complication here is that because the SID and CIDs, those subnet IDs and component IDs, are, are, are softly definable, they're defined at runtime, and because the routing can be specified in a lot of different ways, unlike USB, where the routing is specified by the hardware, it's like the routing to any particular, there's only one route to any device in USB, because it's a straight tree. Uh, in Gen Z, you can have a fabric, and so you can have multiple routes. How you set up the routing is, is not determined, cannot be determined automatically. It's a policy decision. So this was the first place where we said, wait a minute, where do we want to do policy? Do we like to do policy inside the Linux kernel? Yes. Right? We don't like to do policy in the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel likes to say, no, I don't do policy. Policy is done by somebody outside of me. So when we started looking at stuff like this, when we started thinking about how, how we wanted it to work in Linux, we started thinking, wait a minute, we need to do some of the management of this fabric in user space. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in the Gen Z spec has one uh, component on the fabric as being the fabric, the fabric manager, um, and, then there's, and then there's a backup if that one can't be reached. Grant, you have a question? Yep. about routing a lot, can you explain how uh, probing and discovery of devices goes? Because PCI has a whole discovery protocol yep. of how to discover devices, so does USB. So does Gen Z. And so does Fiber Channel, and yep. so does InfiniBand, and... Yep. Of course. So how does it, can you, can you give a little <coughs> flavor on how that works? Uh, Jim, why don't you talk about that? We'll get you well, a mic. we can fix that. <laughs> okay. Um, so the discovery happens, but you start out with some device that you're connected to. If you're on a CPU, that's the bridge, as he talked about. So you, you, you know where the bridge is. You find that by some other mechanism, like PCI. Maybe it's, you know, it appears as a PCI device, or maybe it's in ACPI. But you've got a connection to your local Gen Z component. And um, you will cause it to, to it, it's, it, has, it has something in it called control space, which he hasn't talked about yet, um, which is, on the order of PCI config space, same kind of idea. It's, it's a place that has defined architected structures in it that you can talk to, and you can find out how many interfaces your component has. And then you can, you can cause a packet to go out each one of those interfaces, and you can find out what's on the other side of it, assuming the link is up. And once you've done that, um, maybe it's a switch and you want to talk to it. Um, so then, then there's this concept in Gen Z called a, a directed relay, where you send the packet to that switch, and then it sends it out the, the interface that you want. And so you, you basically build out one step at a time, discovering the entire fabric by using these control space accesses and sending packets out the designated uh, interfaces. Does that make sense? Okay. So yes, there is a, there's an, there is a scalability, an inherent scalability problem that, you know, the more devices there are, the more transactions you have to send to each one, to, and, and there's like some kind of n-squared problem going on there, right? Um, yeah, so, so as, as Keith said, routing is done completely by um, SID and CID, the subnet and component IDs, totally separate from addressability. Um, in Gen Z, every component you discover has a 64-bit data space of its own. Um, in terms of mapping that into the address space of the, your host on the original side, Gen Z has this concept called a ZMMU, a Gen Z memory management unit, which basically says, given some physical address on my local host, what component ID and address do I want to send this to? So that's how you map remote 
objects into your address space. So instead of the resource allocation being done globally across the entire fabric, the, a the, re the address space allocation is done locally per component. Each component sets up a mapping from its physical address space to the global Gen Z address space, which consists of a subnet ID, a component ID, and a 64-bit address. So you have 32 bits, uh, 16 bits of subnet, 16 bits of component, 12, 12 bits of component, bits um, and 64 bits of address within that, within, that, uh, within that component. So then you map that into your own local, so unlike PCIe, which has a single address space for the entire thing, right, we have one address space per component. So at least we don't have address space allocation that you have to talk to the devices about. Exactly. Yeah. You like it? Wow. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, here, here's, here's some more uh, uh, similarities and differences. Uh, Gen Z enumeration, uh, as, as we talked about, is controlled by walking the control space, doing uh, reads and writes at a control space, just like PCIe is, is done, you know, you, you read out of PCI control, uh, control space. Um, Routing in Gen Z, as I said, is all controlled by software, um, unlike uh, PCIe and USB, which is fixed by the topology. Right? If you're going to route a USB transaction, there's only one route to every USB device. You don't have multipath, so you don't have any questions. Um, uh, Gen Z does, of course, it does everything. It does both memory map, memory map access and you can send messages. So you can, you can actually build a network on top of this that it does not know about the remote addresses. You're just sending a message to a particular, what is it, a registered, like? It's a context. A context, yeah. So it's like a port. Right? You can send a, a datagram to a port on a remote machine. Um, so, what we, so this is like kind of a picture, this is my lame picture for management, of what the Linux driver stack looks like, where you have, um, where you have a bus subsystem and then you have um, uh, uh, bus-specific drivers that talk into the particular subsystem. So when we talk about Gen Z, um, whoa, what happened? We talk about Gen Z, and then we're talking about creating a Gen Z subsystem, and then some Gen Z device drivers on top of that that, that plug into existing kernel infrastructures. So if you have a, if you have a, a block device that's accessible over Gen Z, then you're going to write a Gen Z block device driver that sits on top of the Gen Z subsystem uh, that provides a block interface to the kernel. So I can, I can write a file, I can put a file system on that. Um, if you have a network, uh, a, a, a network thing that you want to do over Gen Z, then I could create something that looked like a network device driver um, and, and plug that into the network subsystem. Um, and the other thing that I'm, the other thing we're going to expose here is this bus management driver, right? In, in PCIe or USB, that's all inside the kernel, right? When you talk about USB, uh, USB devices uh, device IDs are assigned dynamically by the kernel. It's a pretty simple policy. The last device was number 10. The <coughs> next device is going to be number 11. Uh, with Gen Z, because we want to we want to make this expo we want to expose this to user space, we're going to have to come up with an API between that bus management layer and user space because we're going to pump a bunch of that stuff up into user space. Um, and that means that Gen Z may not entirely come up without user space. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, right now it's pretty simple when you, when you have, a, when you have a, an init RAM FS. It's like, well, you could do a bunch of stuff in there to get the bus to talk to the rest of your peripherals. What if you're booting from Gen Z? What does that even mean? You know, can I, can I do that successfully? And the answer is, we don't know yet. That's a, a, you know, if the BIOS can load an, an image over Gen Z into RAM, then I guess we're good. Yeah, and so just like, um, just like USB, where the BIOS often enumerates the USB devices and, and numbers them all and, and talks to them in, in, at, at boot time to get a boot image, and then the kernel comes along later and re-enumerates the entire bus, I imagine we're going to end up with something similar to that on Gen Z. I don't know how far out uh, the BIOS will end up enumerating Gen Z or if it does it at all. I have no idea. That's the BIOS person's problem. I'm not a BIOS engineer, and our team doesn't do BIOSes yet. Well, one comment. To, you, have to, you have to understand that corporations involved in Gen Z are interested in having unmodified OSs, right? The current Red Hats and Windows. And so there's a big push to make sure un, unmodified OSs work. And so there's a big push in some parts of the consortium to put a lot of that stuff in the firmware, yeah. right? So that you don't have to change the kernel. 
no, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in changing the kernel. Right. So as I said, we, uh, we've been talking about this PCI emulation to make Gen Z look like PCI. And so it may be that all the BIOS, that the way that you boot off of Gen Z is by having the BIOS do PCI emulation, and we use the existing PCI stack in the BIOS. Who knows? Not our problem. Come on. So really simple plan, right? Create a new Gen Z bus subsystem. Uh, that's create, but kind of with a small c. Uh, because when we talk about creating a new bus subsystem, really what we're going to go do is steal code and ideas from existing bus subsystems. I've talked about how USB and, uh, and PCIe are, have a lot of uh, uh, commonality with Gen Z, and so we're going to go steal a bunch of that stuff. Um, and expose the management up to user space and hope it all works out. Uh, so we're hoping to have some... Uh, oh, this presentation is really long. Uh, one of the things we're working on right now is a software simulation of Gen Z, so we can actually do a bunch of this development uh, with, with no hardware at all. I mean, we're, what we're doing is we're creating uh, multiple VMs on a, on a shared infrastructure and using inter-VM uh, messaging and inter-VM shared memory uh, <coughs> to set up kind of a little virtual Gen Z bus. Um, and so we're hoping to be able to simulate Gen Z to the point where we can get all the management infrastructure, uh, demonstrate that on a laptop. You know, instead of having to have actual Gen Z hardware, so we can do a bunch of this development uh, in a pretty simple emulation environment. So, are other, I mean, are there representatives of other people who are talking about Gen Z within their companies here? Who have experiences to share or? Awesome. We didn't talk about security at all. Uh, Gen Z actually has a pretty elaborate security story, and that's longer than this boff would go on for. There are, I'll, there's a bunch of security stuff in the Gen Z stuff about, about R keys and, and S keys and all kinds of stuff. Obviously, with you know, talking about byte level accessibility, you, you need to have some access control. Yeah. Uh, if there are other questions, we'll be around. Um, I'm afraid our, our boff time is about up. Um, if you have questions, you know, I'll, I'll hang around. We have a break uh, right now. It's actually started about six minutes ago. Um, if you want to come up and chat with us uh, during the break, we'll be here. But otherwise, really, I really appreciate uh, everybody showing up and asking interesting questions and challenging our assumptions that Gen Z is going to be the best thing ever. And keep us honest as we implement code and submit patches because, you know, it's going to be a bunch of new code and it's going to be wrong the first several iterations because it always is. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, we'll be here. Uh, ask us questions. Thanks for coming up. Thanks for coming by. Okay, you guys about ready to talk about painful, painful stuff? Actually, the last presentation had some painful things that they discussed. I think you, uh, you remember some of that. So, quick quiz before uh, we start. We've had some file system discussions. We've had lots of good discussions, block device discussions. What was the favorite so far? Do you guys have a favorite uh, presentation so far? Any, anything? Okay. Well, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about some of the file system activity that's been, um, you know, driving things I worry about every day and some of the people in this room and some of the people at this conference. You know, if you picked up your phone and looked at FSDevel today, you know, if you look today, what would you see as things that are bugging people in file systems? What would you see in activity? You'd see things relating to, f to file notify. You'd things splice. Use after free and lock paths, lots of lock bugs forever for 20 years. And uh, then some IOMAP issues, DAX issues. It's interesting, I think if you looked at the same list five years ago and 10 years ago, you'd see a lot of commonality. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Just a little background, I used to be the file system architect at IBM. I work for Microsoft now in Azure Storage. I uh, authored the original SysVFS, which is one of the larger and more active VFSs. Um, uh, former Storage Network Working Group Chair and uh, 
I work in Azure storage now on the Linux side, and I think there's a number of Microsoft people here presenting, so it's kind of an interesting change for me to see Microsoft presenting on Linux, something I find fascinating. This is, as we saw here, this is not a Microsoft presentation, but I am intrigued uh, about all this recent change. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? I'd like to talk about some general activity. I'd like to talk about some of the changes that have been going on. I wanna talk about some of the things that are driving um, this activity. And, um, but let's start with some status updates. So what has, um, what's happened in the last 14 months? I think you, as you saw a few days ago, we released the People's Front, right? So actually, do it, does anybody know, is that a reference to Monty Python? Yes, Okay. Right. Okay, so there, there's two People Fronts. Do you know which People's Front it is? Uh, it's probably the JPF. Okay, so it's probably the Judean People's oh, Front. It could be the PFJF. Yeah. Anyway, I was curious about that. I, I had a vague memory from long ago. Um, that's, that's the joke, it's so important. Yeah. So anyway, this is an interesting joke about the People's Front, but here we deal with uh, some really cool activity. Now, what's been driving the activity over the last, uh, well, actually for a long time? Well, Dave Howells and the new Mount API, a new FS Info API, because every file system has different types of metadata to return. Uh, we have various security issues, security features. Um, but there are many new security features that are important. I think a lot of you have seen discussions about NVMe, about faster storage technology, and how that affects network file systems, how it affects local file systems, how it breaks things in unusual ways. The I.O. patterns are different. We have cheaper, faster network adapters. You know, I've got 40 gig adapters at home now. You want to copy that Monty Python movie that you watched? You want to copy it in a few seconds instead of a few hours? We've got StatX came in, Dave Howell's StatX came in about a little over a year ago. How do we extend that to include attributes relating to offline storage, the cloud, new security attributes, things that matter for cluster file systems, for specialized file systems, for network file systems? I think many of you saw Derek, uh, Dave Chinner and Derek and the changes they've recently done for Ddupe. <coughs> Lots of things relating to locks and locks and locks and more locks of uh, driving activity. Now, if you look through the last week's activity, you'll still see things like XFS supporting larger block sizes than page size. It's been an issue for many, many years. And my favorite, we have Olga who has the patch set about uh, broadening the use of, of uh, a copy offload. We should allow copy offload between two mounts in the same file system, let the file system figure it out. Make copy faster. People actually do file copies occasionally and fix our copy tools. And of course, I work in Azure, so I deal with long latencies in cloud as the target. Anyway, you had a question. Yeah, just. Uh, well, like actually, it's supposed to repeat to our the audience. Oh, there it is. Yep. is this the only uh, page? I hate to uh, to guess ahead for the next no, slide, we, uh, but I'm curious about 64-bit uh, time. I don't see it here. Ah, yes, a good point. So his point about 64-bit time is well thought, and it is dro it drove a lot of activity. <laughs> Um, I don't mention it particularly here because um, a lot of it has, um, has been done. I think, as you know, uh, both NFS and SMB support longer timestamps. It varied by file system. SMB uses DCE time, so start back you know, 500 years, 400 years. NFS supports uh, the, uh, the larger timestamps as well. So there are a variety of file systems, but it is hell for XFS test when you're testing to appliances running Linux because you don't know what file system's time granularity, or actually you do, you can find it, but it's a little tricky to get XFS tests to pass when the time granularity is coarse on some Linux file systems and fine-grained on others, because the network protocols and cluster protocols generally support the 64-bit timestamps, but not all local file systems do. These changes, as far as I know, haven't been a controversial, but if you're aware of something, maybe we can talk about that toward the end. Okay, so at the File System Summit, you'll recognize many of the people here uh, obviously a great group of developers. I think you guys can, can see some familiar faces there. And uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing to work with this group. This was in uh, Park City, Utah this year. And uh, you know, watching this, some of the, the discussions has been very, very enlightening over the years. And it's a hard problem. Okay, so what are the most active file systems? Any polls? Anybody know what the most active file system is? 
ButterFS and XFS, yeah. ButterFS1 and XFS2. So ButterFS had 927 changes. I just measured it, you know, just before my presentation. I was kind of curious. This is to RC2 from 415. So what is it, 10 months, something like that? So uh, BTRFS had almost 1,000 changes. Its activity is up. XFS 564, its activity is up. Um, then the VFS itself, uh, F2FS and SIFS. Uh, then you have, you know, NFS. You know, it's, it's interesting. One of the things people don't realize, the NFS server is actually not that active in the kernel compared with some of the user space servers like Ganesha or like some of the people I was talking to earlier today in Samba. You know, Samba is, you know, 4,000 change sets per year, right? The, so user space servers are a lot bigger. But, you know, it's interesting to see these activity. You know, BTRFS, XFS, the VFS overall are extremely active file systems. And, you know, you just look at the, remember I pulled up the mailing list just now. You'll see Dave Chinner, you'll see a lot of really interesting patches. Uh, so this uh, is a fascinating time. Uh, I work on SIPSKO, our activity is up more than 100%. So it looks good. We're, I'm very pleased to see that activity coming from Red Hat, coming from SUSE, coming from t over 20 companies. It's a lot of fun. Okay, so here's the myth. A lot of people think that we support POSIX. I mean, do we care? I mean, POSIX is pretty small compared to what we have to support in Linux. When you look at XFS test, half the tests are testing things that aren't even in POSIX, right? They're, they're, so, you know, let's look at this realistically. Our problem in file systems, we got 293 syscalls, maybe more now, but I, I looked at this a few months ago. 293 syscalls, less than half of them are POSIX. So we got a lot of work as file system developers and people think it's just POSIX. So what are the goals? We wanna make Linux fast, right? We wanna make it secure. You know, if you're an NFS developer and you're trying to mount to some NetApp appliance, you want it secure and fast and stable, predictable. You want the app writers to not know they're running on a network file system or a block file system or cluster file system. You don't want them to worry about the timestamp granularity and something to break because of small, strange behavior changes among file systems. We have over 60 file systems in Linux, not counting Fuse. I don't know how many of you guys sat through the presentation just before this was talking about Fuse user space would more than double the number of file systems. That's a lot of file systems. And as an app writer, you're not gonna special case every single one of those. You might special case BTRFS. You're not gonna special case NFS, SMB3, XFA, F2FS, you know, every single file system. So we have to make it predictable for app writers. We have to make it secure and reliable and give them the integrity features they need. Okay, so what about presentations at this conference? Um, We've already had the one just before this, but look at the other seven or eight presentations just at this conference on various file system topics. Zero copy, user mode, file name encoding, case instance set to file names. That's actually of significant interest to me because I have to deal with servers like uh, Windows that are mostly uh, case insensitive. Um, I have to deal with both. Untrusted file system, shift FS, FS checkpointing. Um, and then of course we have this presentation on VertIO. How do we optimize I.O. and cluster and network file system cases to take advantage of things like Vert I.O. and more and more, and I've left out some. Okay, so just before the call, I was talking to Jeremy Allison, the lead server developer for Samba. What are your favorite pain points? What do you love to hate about the kernel? And his first thing was, why don't we have NFS ACL support or rich ACL support, or whatever you want to call it, or SMB ACL support? Why don't we have that? Because we have petabytes of data we cannot migrate to Linux without rich ACLs. <coughs> Whether you call it NFS 4.1 ACLs, whether you call it ZFS ACLs, they already support all this stuff, right, in Samba. But you have petabytes worth of data that he was aware of that cannot be migrated because there are no deny aces. All of those models are close enough. But without this, so many things break. Obviously, every modern server, EMC, NetApp, uh, every other operating system in the world except for Linux supports that concept. So that was his number one complaint. His second was an interesting security problem that I hadn't thought about. Oh no follow is useless. If you're a server developer and you're worried about somebody changing a path out from underneath you due to a symlink, you need the whole path to not to be oh no follow. Oh no follow is only the tail end of the path. So as a Samba developer, they're dealing with really hard security problems where nasty people are trying to get an Etsy password or some evil path by using symlinks. So how do we make it so ONO oh follow is 
over the whole path, not just the target. So that was an interesting thing. And of course, he has the various things about locking and performance and async I.O. and all that. But those were the top two, and they're kind of interesting. So we as file system developers, how do we fix this? Well, okay, what's my favorite problem? Copy. I was experimenting a little bit with um, you know, various platforms, Windows, Mac, et cetera. And one of the things I noticed was that um, RoboCopy, a common tool that Windows admins use, parallelizes I.O. Why does that matter? Well, when you do a, something simple, you take your laptop, mount to something, an NFS or SMB, you peg the CPU. Why are you pegging the CPU in some cases? Well, the answer is because depending on your network uh, copy offload and the adapter and such, your I.O. is not well parallelized. You're copying you know, dozens of large files, but you're not issuing many copies in parallel like RoboCopy would. You're not issuing lots of I.O. in parallel from different processes. So it tends to overuse one processor and peg. So performance is a lot worse than it should be for something as simple as copy. Okay, and then there's a really interesting discussion that's been going on. Um, it's close to merge ready, I think, but Olga was talking about NFS copy offload. Why can't we allow NFS to decide whether it can copy from mount A to mount B? SMB, same thing. Why can't we let SMB or cluster file system decide it can copy from A to B because we're gonna copy it a lot faster than if you read every byte and write every byte, right? That's very expensive. Letting the back end file system do the copy is much faster than having every page read in and every page read, written out. In many cases, this can be done in the back end literally a thousand times faster. So this copy parallelization, this allowing cross, or cross mount copy from the same file system, letting the file system do what it does best, right? Let BTRFS or XFS or NFS or SMB figure out or Gluster, let it figure out what it can do. Don't limit the local file system artificially. So we do too much sometimes in the VFS when a file system sometimes could do it more efficiently. And copy was just a blatant example of this. So a fascinating example to Azure. In many cluster file systems, in many cloud file systems, it's expensive to update metadata. So rsync and some other file systems had options, or copy tools, had options CP doesn't, I don't think, but has an option to set the file size once, right, very fast. Now there's no metadata updates. The standard Linux copy tools, when you copy every single block, and sometimes these block sizes are quite small, is updating metadata, updating metadata, updating metadata on every single extending write. So question? Yeah, I was just wondering. Well, let's yeah, they said to talk to the. So, if VM you have an, a, an atomic set of your file size and then you copy in the data, uh, how is that not a security risk? You're exposing potentially um, previous data that was on the hard drive uh, within that file. You know what I mean? So, you, you say, I, I, I want to copy a, a file that's one megabyte. So, you say, you set the inode to say it's a, it's a megabyte and then you start loading in the data, but you get a third of the way. Well, the other th two thirds is whatever's already on the disk and has space allocated for it. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. So, you know, back to the, to the general point, a file system doesn't have to support all of these features. So let's take the example of, you know, SMB or NFS, right? You could, s they support sparse files. Most cluster file systems support sparse files. So that extending right, empty, nothing happened. There is no data there, there are no pages, so there's no security exposure because you've set it to one megabyte, any read of that will just return zeros because it's empty. Now CP itself supports sparse files. So the CP command itself does check for sparse files, but it doesn't set the file size first, so you can have this extending write problem. So if it detected a sparse file, it would copy it more efficiently, but it doesn't set the file size once now, set the file size once, there are no pages behind it, so there's no security, there's no data being leaked. This isn't the, the optimal for all file systems. This, I'm not suggesting this is the default that you should move to, but there are at least, there is at least one tool in Linux, and certainly in Windows and Macs, that allow you to, as a parameter, do this, which is a huge help 
when you have these weird back-end cluster file systems, I'm sure that there are guys out here working for NAS vendors that have strange cluster file systems, where metadata ops are expensive. And it's an example of a simple option. Um, and it would be great to expand the sparse file support beyond CP. Okay, back to IO sizes. So last I checked, um, and Chuck could probably confirm, uh, NFS uses one meg IO by default, I believe, right? Uh, SMB uses, uh, Windows uses either one or eight. We use four. Um, I saw a little bit worse performance Linux to Linux with eight, so I, I moved the SMB one to four meg instead of eight meg. But the reason for a larger I.O. is, you know, with these moderate network adapters, basically, you've got large packet sizes. It's very efficient to send one meg or larger. Now, you try the DD command, you try many of these commands, if it was unbuffered, they're gonna copy 512 bytes, 4K, it's terrible. And you know, that's literally gonna be 10 times slower or 50 times slower, depending on your latency to copy that way than leveraging these larger I.O. sizes. So as you saw earlier, I mentioned an XFS patch where they're dealing with larger block sizes, making block size larger than page size. That introduced a lot of problems. So how do we get the copy tool smart enough to copy the right sizes, big enough so a cluster file system or these specialized file systems go faster? You know, this is 2018, not 1980 something where a 512 byte copy size might make sense. Okay, rich Apple problem. As I mentioned, Jeremy Allison, Google, Samba team, he viewed this as the number one problem with the Linux file system API. It's been argued about for years. What's the problem with this? We have POSIX ACLs. They don't support deny modes. And unfortunately, with government regulations, European laws, privacy laws, HIPAA, there are so many cases where you need narrow deny aces and a more complicated model. Apache, many of these web services have gone to a model where they allow very intricate claims for allowing or denying access decisions. We have no such capability in Linux without some way of storing something that is richer than our current POSIX allow. And even worse, mode bits are somewhat painful to deal with. Now, what about metadata? Every file system has metadata. If you look at the NFS RFC, NFS 4.2, you'll see file system related metadata. You'll see various named attributes that can be returned on, on, uh, on inodes. You'll see various uh, uh, metadata that can be returned not just on the file system, but also on files. So, same with SMB3. You've got things that are unique to uh, a Windows server or a Mac server, and you have things that actually are generic. Like, I looked at the last set of flags. Um, let's say, for argument's sake, that you're sitting in Starbucks and you're mounted to Azure because you're downloading your presentation. Or you've got a resume because you're talking to a new person, so you're running, you know, LibreOffice on a, some SMB3 mount to, to sitting in Starbucks. When you look at that, you know, it's in the cloud, longer latency. Do you want to advertise that support to some apps? Because, you know, if you're a Mac, you know, their little finder, it queries the icon as, you know, bring up a window. Do you want to do that if it's loaded in the cloud? If you have something that's cached in the backend server in the cloud, do you want to do that? So I was looking at some of the flags relating to offline storage and things like that that were added in Windows recently. They're just as important for Linux as they would be to Windows or Mac. And I thought about this, like why aren't we exposing more metadata? We've been kind of conservative. We've exposed the Statix API, but the number of flags, you know, we really could add a lot more. And then similarly, there's been discussion about the file system uh, info. You know, there's no real harm in some of these cases because they apply to Windows just as well as they do to Linux or the Mac as well as they do to Linux. They, they're not just unique to one OS. Some of these actually, some of these, some of these flags, does it have, as an example of this, does it have extended integrity checks? In other words, is it a higher reliability file? Is that file marked for more integrity? Well, that's a flag Windows supports. You could also imagine this being supported in Linux where one file is marked as more reliable than another. So you can set this file as more important. Okay, so a big theme I wanna talk about here. Sometimes the file system 
ext4, xfs, butterfs, nfs, smd, knows more than the VFS layer. It knows what block device it's on. It knows the characteristics of the block device a little bit better, perhaps. It knows attributes of how it was formatted, how it's intended security issues. It knows the identity of the user better. It can optimize more efficiently sometimes in the VFS layer. When you're copying from A to B, if you give it to the file system, sometimes the file system, you know, at the higher level, the file system can do it more efficiently, the low level file system than the, than the mapping layer. Okay, let's talk about some of these cool features. Um, we've had, over the past year, some really neat changes for dedupe. We've had some great enhancements um, in the file system layer. I think you saw that, that's, that uh, set of APIs that we talked about earlier, and you've seen the change rate in the file system. Now, file systems are one of the most active areas of Linux kernel. I think one of the problems we're going to have is how do we get together and discuss this? Well, good news, next year we have uh, Vault restarting after a one-year absence. Uh, we also have the file system summit. Uh, we have the storage developer conference every year, and of course it'll be also in uh, Tel Aviv in January. There'll be another one. Um, so we'll have two storage developer conferences next year, one in the fall and then one in January. Lots of opportunities to discuss these storage features. But what's probably more important than any of this? Testing. So I think as you've seen, every file system uses XFS test despite its name. There are lots of files. Here's an example from my CIFS code of a wiki that I set up for this. Ted So, who you've probably seen wandering around, has done a really good job on showing how to automate XFS testing. Um, for his example of the XT4, we need to add to it. We need to increase it. It's a really nice bucket for dumping all of the tests because what's our goal? To make sure all this stuff works reliably. So, you know, far more important than anything else here, I think, is, is getting this testing. Um, as Samba, you know, Samba has a developer kind of culture that every time you put a new feature in, you have to put the test case in first. We're not quite as good about that in, in the kernel VFS, but you know, it sometimes come, sometimes we're able to do that. But this is an area where I really want to hammer how important that is. Okay, so we've got a couple minutes left, and the problem is that everybody here knows more than I do about their particular whatever. So let's open up some questions. I see some in the back. Let me hand the VMware block out so you can ask it and see what pain points most interest you. So it's, it's been a while since I've worked on file systems. I actually work for Microsoft. Uh, one of the innovations that happened probably about five, six years ago was, you know, just like offload, copy offload, there was also the trim offload, right? Yes. Which was the unused space. Uh, allocations being sent down to the device. Is, is that going anywhere? Is that widely adopted? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question, trim offload. And any opinions here about trim offload? Um, you know, one of the things that we ought to also ought to talk about is there is this wonderful T10-like API that's similar to NF SMB and NFS have a similar way of supporting this. Um, some of the features in that, being able to handle block device offload a little bit better. So it's, the file system is mapping it down to the block layer. Mm -hmm. um, these are interesting things to think about. I find fascinating. Any comments about that, guys? So what favorite pain points do you guys have? You guys, uh, let me get. I can throw it to you. This is actually more of a user space um, thing, but the kernel provides a lot of facilities for making things a bit easier, like file, file copies and various metadata updates. But when you're writing code that actually makes use of them, you end up having to write, rewrite the same sort of fallback to like, oh, well, this kernel is too old, this kernel is too old. Yep. And also like, oh, do I, can I use ref links here? Can I use send file here? It'd be quite useful to have a library for sort of common file system operations. Yep. Please use whatever the most efficient operation this kernel supports to do this operation. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. So one of you guys, some of you guys might remember there was a discussion I just saw about 
uh, glibc. Uh, did, you guys, did you guys follow that? glibc versus the kernel owning the mapping of these. So for argument's sake, say you add some user space API that's useful. The problem is that the kernel developer who wrote that now has a syscall that's exposed in a really ugly way and no library to call that. So you have a completely separate team over here and a completely separate file system team over here. And as an app developer, you don't see a library that matches your kernel. You're calling glibc, which is unrelated to your kernel. So it's a difficult thing where typically in Windows or Mac or whatever, your, your, your user space library and your kernel, you would see the entry point. Um, or you wouldn't. If you didn't see the entry point, you know not to call it. So you know your example of reflink or whatever is, is a good one. So one of the other fascinating things is metadata. So how do I in SIFS see if I can support the reflink API call? Well, I query metadata on the file system on the target and look, hmm, okay. It advertises support for block ref counting. Okay, if it supports block ref counting, it supports reflink. Okay, that's easy. But I have no way of telling the user, the app, don't even bother calling reflink. I have the, I'm querying this, I can dump it to debug data, but there's no statfs API call. Remember Dave Howell's, I mentioned Dave Howell's patch. So an, your app could query, hmm, that file system doesn't support reflink. I mean, it would if you mounted to this server, but not this server. Or you would if you mounted here, but not here. I know that, and so I can return EDOP not supported, but it would be nice in your app if you could query the statfs and get that back. And I think that was one of the intents of Dave Howell's patch to allow file systems to return more information. And if you look at the NFS RFC for 4.2, if you look at the SMB um, protocol standard documentation, you'll see there's quite a bit of metadata like this that would be valuable for app developers to be able to query. So they could make decisions about how to compensate in user space without going through really convoluted error paths. And the problem yeah. is not the errors paths, the problem is the error numbers. One file system is going to return EOP not supported, one's going to return EIO, another's going to return E no end. So you're, it'll confuse your app. So it's, a, it, it's really quite painful uh, for some of these features. So what, uh, what other pain points? You guys have some favorite ones? Yeah, uh, let's. Yeah, so I guess I'm just wondering when the next thing comes along. I mean, or if we are evolving our current things into the next thing. So I see a lot of, I mean, we've got, with XFS, we recently got ref links. Mm -hmm. I've seen plans to internalize that capability and perhaps bring XFS the capability to do snapshots or things mm -hmm. like this. We've got ButterFS, but honestly, I don't know, if, is anybody convinced that's gonna mature to the point that it's supported by enterprise distributions? Uh, when are we going to get to um, the point where we've got purpose-built file systems for modern storage, yep. you know, not spinning media? Apple had one come out recently. Yep. Uh, it's got thin provisioning, snapshotting, it checksumming, redundancy capabilities, all of these modern things. If we want those things now, we have to stack it up through device mapper, use the file systems that we have. I mean, what is on the horizon. Yeah, this is a, these are, I think you've phrased it extremely well. So let's step back 10,000 feet. If you knew somebody, you know, I don't know, maybe there's some guys in their 60s here who could go pull out college textbooks, maybe guys in the 70s. It's really interesting. File system problems haven't, I mean, there's still, there's stuff in the 60s in file system text that still apply. So these aren't new. Second thing, you bring up a lot of really good points. Um, Purpose-built file systems. I think that we have enormous work to do, but it's focused largely on a few local file systems and then the cluster and network things, right? Because there aren't, I mean, if you look at the file system activity, it's really, for local file systems, it's maniacal focus on four or five file systems locally. That's it. It's not like, you know, this isn't, you know, JFS and RiserFS and all these, it's not, nobody cares about these, right? We've got, it's, it's really, and as you said, XFS, rather than in BTRFS, has the reputation for more enterprise workloads. 
But I think that the bigger problem is that distros that we tend to use, I mean, a lot of people are using RHEL. How old is RHEL kernel? It's basically four or five years old. Many of the features that actually are in XFS and ButterFS users aren't aware of because they're running. Now, what's the most recent stable distro kernel? Probably Ubuntu, right? What's that? 415. How old is it? Almost a year, right? So there's been a lot of activity that you're not seeing in, in what people actually run. And I think unlike Windows or Mac, you're not seeing rollouts of these new features in service upgrades every six months. You're seeing some user space changes, but a lot of these key kernel features for XFS aren't getting there. Um, it's fascinating you mentioned snapshots because, you know, uh, I remember the snapshot support for, for XFS experimental stuff many years ago. So this is, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, is very important. It's, it's it, it's a lot of effort to produce these new features, and it takes a long time to bake them in, which is why I guess I'm wondering why we haven't gotten started on maybe the next thing right. yet. Or as I said, it could be that we're just evolving these things. But you mentioned that um, some of these concepts have been around since the beginning. I mean, I remember reading about the BFS file mm -hmm. system and how they developed that with the extended attributes and everything. But uh, it was very much centered around this idea of spinning media with locality of reference right. and all these things. It's still there in, in, in XFS with allocation groups and things like this. What I'm talking about is like with the modern hardware, y you, you want to do more, I mean, like uh, trims and, you know, a a allowing garbage collection and things like this. So, so copy on write semantics and um, you know, it, things that will preserve that hardware. You're no longer concerned about the sorts of things that you were uh, tied to before. I think these points are great. Now, I remember back in the IBM days, you know, Linux architect, all that, dealing with file system questions, I was witnessing this argument between LVM and the IBM equivalent. One of the things that's fascinating is we've constructed an abstraction layer that's about as bad as possible for some workloads because it hides from the guy who needs it, you know, ButterFS or XFS, the physical attributes of the device underneath it in some cases. So it's much easier to lie to FS or XFS about the actual characteristics because ultimately the placement of those blocks is dependent on many things that only the file system is aware of. And yet we're in this world where we're making assumptions, as you say, that are directly tied to spinning disks, not modern SSDs, much less the 10 to 100 times faster NVMEs. At home, I have an NVMe. It's really cool to get multiple gigabytes per second copying, but it's not optimal because the file systems weren't designed to handle. I mean, you can go on Amazon and get a relatively cheap NVMe. Our file systems aren't optimized for that. Yet at the same time, some of the backend cloud file systems and some of these specialized file systems behind NFS appliances or Samba appliances are. But how do we get these a little bit broader? Um, I think this is a very good point you make. So the other thing too is that um, I, you brought up a good point about uh, having the um, all these separate layers. It, it, you have the file system who's trying to think in terms of spinning or rotational media, but you have thin provisioning, caching, and things like this at the device mapper layer or whatever. Um, but there are ways where I don't know how it'd be possible, but but if if the file system could communicate better with the block layer, you could do more strategic things about, you know, say when you pre-allocate or something, you could tell thin provisioning uh, in the block layer to do that allocation. You could use, um, there's a new target now, it's called uh, uh, DM write cache, and it's a streaming write cache, uh, and you could do vectored atomic writes with that target, in, in which case you could eliminate journaling. Um, so if there was the API in there Yep. available to talk between them. I think these are very important, and some of, we, I think some of these may be touched on later in the conference, and they certainly were touched on the storage developer conference, but one of the things I want to throw out to you guys, just how does it change our model when storage is almost as fast as RAM? You know, persistent storage, pers RAM overlapping address spaces. NVMe is so fast that there are times when in the address space it needs to be exposed. This changes all kinds of things. This is not my area, obviously. This is not something I deal with every day. But it changes how we think about uh, file systems when 
we have storage this fast. Now, back to your snapshot question. Snapshots are evolving. I added snapshot support just, uh, what, for 18 kernel in Linux client. So the SMB client can view snapshots. What are the hell we have to deal with? You mentioned timestamps. Well, the timestamps come in one format, GMT, and they go out in another format. Like, so I query the server, with I have to do a specialized dioctal for it, and then I want to mount with a snapshot, just so you can see your older copy of, you know, the mounts to various older copies of it. I have to, you know, these are the kinds of hell, the little tiny things that you deal with. But one of the things I'm fascinated about is how do I tie something like SMB3, which has had snapshot support forever, how do I tie my version, which is now implemented in the Linux client, rather late compared to Windows, how do I tie that into the more usable infrastructure that Linux user space tools provide instead of having to do kind of hacks like, you know, specifying it on the mount? Mm -hmm. These are challenges and they develop very slowly um, in Linux. So um, it, firstly, did anybody else have a question before I, <laughs> I don't want to drone on. Um, so uh, the, you're right about the, the fast devices and stuff. Like it makes us rethink some of these things. Right now, as I said, we have kind of this device mapper stack and then file system at the top. Um, I, I think about the next file system quite a lot because what it might look like because with NVMe, um, because the file system might be the place where you would want to know about snapshots and encryption and deduplication and all of these other modern things and then write it out once without, it, it knows exactly where it's going in one shot. If you have all this remapping underneath, you're adding just the milliseconds of, you know, extra mm -hmm. operations to get the remapping done and stuff. We recently did some work to try and future-proof ourselves a little bit against some of these things by speeding up device mapper a bit, but, yeah, it, I, I you think know. That, I think that, that layering does add latency the latency matters. I mean, we're dealing with stuff with insanely fast latencies with NVMe today. But also, we're dealing with NFS and SMB running over RDMA, so the network connection to that backend storage is insanely low latency. And yet, we're adding all these layers in the backend that are defeating a lot of the, the value we have there. So I think that, that being able to expose this to ButterFS or XFS to your local file system is very important. But I want to give you another example why. Today on a file system, you might have a, a movie that you're editing. It might have an index that's more important quality. So you might want to mark it for higher integrity. ButterFS could do that or XFS could do that where it marked one file with different attributes than another based on some IO pattern, based on an owner, based on security, based on the app saying this matters more block device doesn't know anything about this. So how do you do this in a way so ButterFS and XFS can expose real workloads where one file matters a thousand times more than another? There was a wonderful storage developer conference presentation, I recommend going back years if you can find it, where they showed how data integrity um, matters now in a world where the, I, the uh, sizes are going from, you know, megabytes to gigabytes to petabytes, right? We're now, the error rate is similar to what it was 20 years ago. But the data sets are so much bigger. So with the data set so much bigger, but the error rate's the same, we have an impossible problem to solve, right? We are creating sort of a, we are going to die. We're all gonna blow up in some horrible accident because data rates Sorry, data sizes are so big and those bit flips are now happening far more often just simply because of the math. We now have bigger sets of data. So, fascinating thing. One of the videos I thought, guy was screaming at his disk drive stack and watching the error rates change as he screamed at his disk. Of course, this wouldn't be a factor with SSD, but I thought it was fascinating to look at that something as simple as yelling at your rack of disks actually, and it was a great video, um, could affect the, the error rate. So we, we have to think about integrity end to end. That means from the NFS or SMB client or a cluster client all the way down through the, the XFS file system, all the way down to the block layer, all the way down. This is a end to end integrity problem that we have to solve. 
and it's getting worse. So I, I was fascinated by that, uh, by that problem. But I do recommend if you go to the Storage Developer Conference, there's some wonderful uh, um, presentations in past years on some of these topics. Okay, uh, I think we're running out of time, right? Uh, thank you guys for your time. There are lots of file system developers lurking around here, so um, you know, obviously bring forth your questions. And Linux FS Devel is a great place to ask these kind of questions. And once again, please send patches and test cases. Okay, thank you guys.